HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Hi, this is Marion Nessel. I'm the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at New York University and a longtime fan of Heritage Radio. Like Marion, you too can support Heritage Radio Network, a member-based nonprofit radio station operating out of Bushwick, Brooklyn. I've been on it countless times. I love being interviewed. The interviewers are always really well prepared and fun to talk to about the issues that matter to me the most, uh, about how we can change our food system to one that's healthier for people and the environment. It's just invaluable to have an independent radio station that's dealing with these issues. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful asset. Support Heritage Radio Network by becoming a member today. Go to heritageradionetwork.org and click on the beating heart to donate. Today's program is brought to you by Whole Foods Market. For more information, visit wholefoodsmarket.com. I'm Laura Stanley, host of Inside School Food. You are listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We, of course, are coming to you live from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And you're listening to The Farm Report. I am your host, Erin Fairbanks. And today we have some special guests joining us in the studio to talk about all things peas. I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Kelvin Lamborn, who is the inventor of the Snap Pea, and his son Rod to the studio Guys, thanks for coming out to Bushwick. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a first for me. Um, I I don't think I've ever been in the presence of the inventor of a vegetable. Um, I almost feel a little bit like I don't totally understand what that means. How does one invent uh, a vegetable? Well, it's not really inventing. It's it's breeding. You, You take... Uh, genetics, things that uh, already exist, and put them together. It's a plant breeder is an artist in that sense, and he has genes to work with. And just like a painter has paint, musician has notes, and and you have words. So, so. so. It's not like you uh, woke up one day and were like putzing around in your backyard. Um, there, there is a certain skill set that you have to acquire. I mean, how did you get into the field originally? Well, it's a long story, but we can make it short. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I had an opportunity to work as a plant breeder. And because I was working for five years before the uh, research or the breeder was going to retire, mm-hmm. and they wanted to give me a little project And the project was to take these snow peas. These are the wide, flat ones that become quite distorted when they're a little over mature. And my challenge was to make them straighter and smoother. Because why? Who wants straighter, smoother peas? 
well Smell in the beef. market. Yes, they, they want things to, to look good. And, and uh, uh, the, the company I worked for really didn't have any experience in snow peas. We, we were breeding peas for freezing and canning. And uh, it was just a project for me to work on. And when was this exactly? This would have been in uh, 1968. Okay, so you've been in the pea business for a hot minute. <laughs> yes, and I'm still in it. And you're still in it. And we are going to get to some of the like very innovative stuff that is is happening. But I want to I want to hear more about. So you were essentially was it like an apprenticeship um, where you were gonna you were kind of working under someone and they're like oh hey you know Calvin this will be your project just see what you can do. Well, it was I was training and watching and uh, it was an extension of what the company was doing and we didn't have any varieties in that class of edible pod so. <clears throat> But then I was left wondering, how am I going to do it? Right. Where do, where do, where do I come? There, w there was no clue of where to, to do it. I didn't know much about pea pods. My earliest experience with pea pods was as a little boy in our garden eating the regular shell peas, the ones that are full of parchment. Yeah. And you chew them down and spit out the pulp. And, and, and then I would make little canoes out of pea pods. You open up the backside, you take the peas out, put a little stick in, and float them. But you know, it was more fun making the canoes than floating them. <laughs> I'm going to guess that, yeah, some of them and, were and maybe I'm, not so I'm, buoyant. I, I'm really surprised on how, well, older people like me, that that we often made our toys, and and how many people actually did it. I would say I grew up in a very similar way. We got kicked out of the house right after breakfast, and we were allowed to come back for lunch. And then when it got dark and outside of that, we had to kind of make our own way. Um, so for someone who is not familiar with plant breeding, can you paint the picture for us a little bit? Are you in, like, a laboratory with a white coat and tweezers and a microscope? Are you vials and beakers? Are you walking around a garden? What does it, like, look like? What are some of the, the basic tools that you were using, um, you know, back in the 60s when you were first playing around with this? Well, you start out in the field, and, and you're looking at plants, and this is exactly how I started. Uh, you know, I had the challenge to make the snow peas flatter and straighter. And uh, with that in mind, in, in the trial grounds, my uh, predecessor had a rogue section, off type, curiosity, and sometimes the visitors would come, sometimes they would bring their wives, and they, they weren't necessarily interested in the difference between a canner and a freezer type P, and so we had these oddities to show them. Right. And among those oddities was one that had albinos, that is, that the, the plant would produce some albinos, white ones, and that the, when they grow, uh, that comes up a little white plant and it dies, but uh, if you cut open that pod, uh -huh. While the peas are still developing, they, they are, those seeds are white, and the rest of them are green. And because we had gone through this dialogue a few times, I became the cutter. I mean, I would find the pot, I would cut it to show the, the visitor, and, and yeah, they'd say, isn't that interesting? And then the next rogue over was one that's called a tight potted rogue. So there I am with knife in hand, and I pick it, and, and my predecessor didn't tell me, you know, why is it tight so far? I was curious, you know, well, why, why is it tight? Uh -huh. And so I cut it open, and I noticed the pod flesh was thicker, about right. twice as th thick as the regular peas. Bingo. Right. I had something to work with. That was my first cross I made on my own curiosity. So essentially there was like a, a is it a greenhouse? Space, no, that, or, no that, or, that, that's that out in the field. Out in the field. So there's just different rows, and they're marked. And because you're growing something, so you, you test it out, it, you, you have to plant the seed and kind of 
Yes. See well, what this, happens. This would be what we call the nursery. This is a group of short rows of different times, and we, we might have a couple hundred items in there, and that's p part of that group. And you would have the standard varieties and the, your latest varieties and the ones you're comparing, and this where the oddities were enclosed. Now, the, the next step is one of those life-changing events, and that is it took a few minutes to make the cross, and that was done in the greenhouse in the fall. And there you use uh, jeweler-type jeweler glasses, magnify, uh -huh. and, and tweezers, uh -huh. and then you have to uh, manipulate the blossom. You find a blossom th that you, you learn when, by the size of the blossom, is the pollen shed yet as that is as the anthers burst open and the pollen is available and then the ones that that are young enough that the pollen has not shed so you you have to take pollen and have it in hand uh -huh. on little tweezers setting the side and so you got the pollen there and then you find a bud and and you it's a delicate operation you open up the blossom you remove the anthers before they they shed any pollen, and now you bring pollen from the, the the actually the male plant to the female plant, and the pistil, the end of the pod. If you look at the end of a pod, uh, there's a little bract that sticks out. That's the female part. Well, actually, the and then the peas are the ovaries, the eggs, and and you do that operation. And so you're making you're doing like a little pea love making situation. Yes. Yes, and sometimes I've referred to that I'm going to go out and get sexy with the pea. Yes, I'll bet. <laughs> so okay. now, what do you do with it? Uh, we didn't get any pods, snow pea, the you know, the wide ones that were th thick flesh. They were all tight potted, round and tight, just like the the the, the father, the male parent. Uh huh. And. Uh, but, but I then crossed it with the snow pea that has, uh, yeah, I need the back up to pick up the, the snow pea that doesn't have parchment in the pod. And, and then we, we cross the, the thick fleshed one that has parchment. Uh -huh. And then the offspring out there, uh, because you're dealing with two genes, it, you, it's one out of 16 that would give you... Uh, a pod that doesn't have parchment. The parchment's the part, like if I stick like an English pea in my mouth, that is like, I, I don't want to chew it. It's too well, fibrous, you, you spit you, it out. Yes. Versus yeah. a snow pea where I can just eat the whole thing. So you're trying yes. to bring the two. Mm -hmm. but, but turn it into one that had thicker flesh. And, and you could But eat we it. didn't get a snow pea. We ended up with a tight potted rogue type. But then, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Right. What do we do with it? Right. And and wondering what to do with it, and see it, it took a few minutes to make the cross, and a couple of years before we had some individual uh, plants to a look at. A couple of years. Yes. Well, so you, this isn't a fast process. Definitely not. And then, uh, you know, I, I begin with what you know, it's not what they asked me to do, but it's, isn't this interesting? The manager and the assistant manager came to the trial grounds, and we took them to look at the, you know, the, the different varieties of shell peas. And I, at the end, I said, well, come over. I want to show you this other pea, see what you think. And I gave a pod to the manager, and he didn't say anything. I gave a pod to the assistant manager, and one bite, he said, this tastes more like a fruit than a vegetable, and children will love them. That is so wild. Yes, but but see, it changed our life. I had a promoter, somebody, and he, from that point, ended up betting his life on the project, and I did too. So I want to just take a time out here, because so you were, on one hand, over the course of this, like, couple year period that you're continuing to breed and, and like, work on the snap pea, you're also at the same time pursuing making the like you know flatter snow pea. You're, you're doing two things at once you have kind of like a 
is it like a secret experiment that you're doing or they're just kind of like oh Calvin you can kind of you know experiment with that area but you were still working on the other or like operationally were you splitting time or well the main purpose was for shell peas right canners and freezers yeah and and this oddity then you, you begin looking at it and what do you do with it and and uh the fellow that that was the assistant manager his name is bill albers we've been working together for 48 years and so he became a supporter but in the beginning there was no support within our company uh, for example the quality control man said it's it's just so much hog food yeah they didn't have the vision no no and they they weren't used to eating pea pods they they weren't uh, uh, s- snow pea enthusiasts by any means even because we were tied with a larger corporation that even a manager that was over our manager even tried to scuttle a program after we got going but you know you you wonder what are you going to do you know i i gave some seed to family and friends and waited to see what they would respond and you know in the winter right. they, they plant it and then they grow it and some come back enthusiastic and you know they caught the vision uh, others was well it, those pods were sure small and they were sure hard to shell <laughs> you're like oh I must have missed something in the instructions here <laughs> yes well uh, and then I learned that we were the biggest challenge was going to be able to get the public to to do that because they they're they're not that much different but they are and if they don't catch it then they they you know they're, they're not going to like them so um one of the conversations that is happening a lot in agriculture it's specific to you know breeding and plant breeding right now is is you know talking about that intellectual property and kind of who owns those discoveries how did that work Be- because you discovered the and, and did the work as part of another organization um did they did that mean it was like yours i mean you said you gave it to friends and family to experiment with i'm just wondering what the like climate around that type of discovery was back in the like late 60s early 70s as this as this is turning into a thing about that time they started to uh, give to a breeder or a company that breeds what they call plant variety protection mm-hmm. and that you could apply for it and and uh, uh, you know it would take a, a little while you had to, to uh, show that it was uniform and stable and and uh, then you would have that protection that somebody couldn't they could grow it for their own use like a home gardener but but they couldn't use it for breeding uh, until after you had the, the the breeders rights then they could breed with it so it didn't stop that but it, it somebody couldn't take your variety and grow it and sell it, which was a common practice back then. Where someone would take your work and so, mm-hmm. so it to me it seems like you're in this position of uh, I don't know balancing a lot of different stuff and making this decision that like hey I you know you have a lot of belief in it feels funny to say you have a lot of belief in the snap pee, but but um, so. You need to, it's different to produce, you know, uh, a, some that, a, a seed that like works on a small like trial plot and then you go into something that's going to be more in, into commercial production. How like fast does that ramp up? You know, how much public support do you need? Like, how does that work where you're rolling out something like that? Well, you, you've got to have somebody that's interested in it. And see, this was a product that was new. Uh, and, you know, how do we get it? Uh, I came to the conclusion that it would need to start with the home garden trade because you've got a package that gives instruction and, and more detail. And we entered 
the variety, this is the first variety, the sugar snap variety, to an organization that's called All America Selections. And they take, our breeders or developers of vegetables and flowers, uh, they take and, and they have judges around the country that grow them out and judge them. And these are often people associated with, with uh, uh, university and, and uh, th that have special interest in, right. in vegetables or, or flowers. And then if they give it an award, then, then they're picked up automatically with, with the packet seed people. And so we, we got an All-America gold medal, which was, they don't give them very often. There hasn't been any since. Oh, wow. And uh, what that did is open up to the garden riders, and they picked up on it, and it was an instant success with garden riders and uh, eventually food riders. We, we had uh, Julia's child. We uh, sent her product several times. Uh, James Beard. Uh, wrote in a way that you couldn't have gone to him and say, we, w we want to hire you to write about this. Right, right. And, and see, far better than something you could buy. And because of that connection, eventually I was able to actually meet him and spend some time with him. That is so... So it's interesting to think about, um, you know, the kind of, garden seed catalogs coming out with like this year's fashions in the same way you get your September issue of Vogue or, or, or whatnot. Like that, there, there was a, it, you know, it's a trend. It's a thing that's like getting picked up. So it goes from kind of the home gardening movement and then transitions from there into a commercial space. Cause now people are what out and like asking for it or there's, there's more interest and people wanting to know the background of the product and uh, growing or other things, particularly the chefs, that's an important thing to, to, to what they're doing. And see, we're well involved with that connection. My son, Rod, uh, living in New York City and a cinematographer, uh, well, I'll let you, let him tell us. What, how he got it started with the chefs. With the chefs. Yeah, so we're fast-forwarding a little bit. Um, and, 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 Rod, were you just, like, out, like, knocking on doors with a bag of peas? Or what, how, how did it go from, like, what was the entree point? Because at this point, I guess, like, sugar snap peas were relatively well-known. Yeah, very yeah. much so, yeah. yeah. Um, well, essentially, I'd been going out into the trials with my father in California, in Baja, Mexico, and spending time with the commercial growers, looking at these different varieties of um, purple, maroon, yellow pods, and um, had been showing them for a long time, and they liked it, and they thought it was interesting. But so none you're of like still exper like experimenting with like new types of peas, or, right? Okay, yeah. So these are these are peas that have different colors or different attributes that you had never had seen before at that time. Um, and so we would show these commercial growers and they thought it was interesting, but then there was no, you know, they just grow and then they sell to somebody else who sells to somebody else. So they're not really in, they're, they're not visionaries and trying to figure not out what the next thing to do space. is. Yeah. So, um, you know, living in New York City, I did, I did figure out pretty quickly that I could meet chefs by saying, well, my father developed a sugar snap pea and I have something that I'd like to show you. And, uh, and I just I, can't even imagine <laughs> what. Yeah, exactly. But when you're talking to the right person, yeah, no, they're very excited about. Very that. compelling, absolutely. Much like myself, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I ended up connecting with uh, Wiley Dufresne at WD50, and uh, coming in and being able to show him some of the varieties. And in the beginning, it was photographs and talking about it, and. There was one season that we were able to, we were getting product from California that we were just, we were FedExing out just so that he could be able to see it. And we did um, a couple months of that. And then the economics didn't really make sense because here we are like sending a 20 pound or a $20 box of peas. It's costing $200 to FedEx. Sure. Uh, and from there, I 
ended up, I asked Wiley, like, well, you know, I need to get some land or I need to talk to a grower. And he suggested that I go to Rick Bishop of Mountain Sweetberry Farm. Great suggestion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I went and I met Rick and he was a little, um, I wouldn't say surprised, but he was a little hesitant at first because I think he's used to people coming at him with all these different varieties or these ideas. Um, but it stuck. And uh, so Rick became the our grower, uh, or not our grower, but Rick became the grower that um, introduced our varieties to New York City. Wow. Um, I don't want to stop. We have to take a short break uh, to hear a quick word from our sponsor who makes the programming here possible, and then we'll be back for more P-Talk. So hang tight. You're listening to The Farm Report. Today's program is proudly brought to you by Whole Foods Market, America's healthiest grocery store with more than 400 locations throughout the United States. Download the Whole Foods Market app on your smartphone for recipes, sales, information, and digital coupons. Or visit WholeFoodsMarket.com to find a store closest to you. All right, we are back. You, of course, are listening to the Farm Report. We are continuing our P Talk. We are in studio with Dr. Kelvin Lamborn and his son Rod Lamborn, and we are talking about the history and the future of all things P related. So, just before the break, um, Rod, you were kind of taking us through um, what's happened. You know, the growing and introducing the new varieties of peas to chefs, but I want to just fill in, uh, Dr. Lambert, you developed the snap peas. It gets picked up. It's a, you know, I guess at this point, I'm guessing a worldwide kind of commercial success, but then you keep tinkering you're, and, and you are to this day, um, experimenting with creating new and different varieties of peas. Is that right? Yes. So Rod, when you're, you, you know, you decide to, to follow in your dad's footsteps and get a little bit into the pea business, and you're out talking to chefs, and you're working uh, with Rick um, Bishop, who's a farmer here. What is the kind of feedback loop look like? I mean, obviously, you 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 guys are are experimenting with things that you think are going to be interesting or that are actually possible, but um, how does it work when a chef's like, well, can you make me a bright orange pea or I want a pea that tastes like bananas or like what, what's, what are those conversations like? Well, if anybody asks us to get peas that taste like bananas, I'll send them a direction that has nothing to do with me. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I mean, essentially we have a lot of specialty varieties of different cover colors and different flavors. And so, um, you know, the request has been more of, do you have any varieties that you've passed on, maybe grow out something that you might have thought is a discard and I'd like to review it. Um, but essentially, there's so many varieties that we have currently that are, that, you know, in the market of the specialty type and yet to come out that we haven't, when people are coming at us with ideas, it's it's usually like, well, why don't you wait and see what we have coming down the road? It is a very okay. slow process. Um, and it's more of talking to chefs and growers that, you know, we have an idea of something that we're going to do, but it's going to take six years until you're going to see the seed. Yeah, that's all. I mean, that's, you know, most restaurants aren't going to be around in six years. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we've got some good stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I guess that's like my question. And sorry, I don't know how to say this without sounding like a little bit more blunt than I mean it. But what's the point? Like, why? Why continue to like tinker? Why is it important to be bringing new P types to markets for chefs, for farmers? Well, a plant breeder is an artist. 
and it's fun to work with different colors and different leaf types. And you know, the pea plant is, is a wonderful plant because it has so many uses. All the way from the seed, the dry seed, there's uh, 9 million acres of dry pea seed grown. So you have the different uh, things that wow. come from dry peas. Pea soup is one of them. And then the shell peas, and then the edible pod ones. But then you've got sprouts, young plants. And what we offer is a, a number of different leaf types. And so they become leafy greens. And then the different colors of pods. And for the future, we, we would like to see the pea plants used as a bouquet. That is, somebody can go to the grocery store, buy a bouquet of pea plant, put it in a vase, add some sugar water to refresh and, and sweeten, and nibble on them. Nibble on them at the dinner table. Just, just like the garden. That uh, definitely appeals it's, it's to the, my like sense of yes, efficiency. The, <laughs> as a plain uh, pea eater, that's one of the things I want to see before I die is for that will occur and it has to begin you know we have people that can grow the peas and harvest them and ship them but is the the consumer ready for them no they're not and this is where working with the chefs and you know if the restaurants in New York City is using pea bouquets then you've got an interest Right. And you can pick up on it. And some uh, food chain may say, well, we'd like to have them. And if they will do the marketing on spot, then then it can go. But see, the this opportunity of having a special event where the bouquets will be featured, then it's, it's a beginning, yeah. a pathway. I like that, too. I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of, like, it's just, it's fun and it's beautiful and it tastes good. And like, those are all really great reasons to, to do something. And it's interesting thinking about, um, all the different ways that New York city chefs and, and are, are really driving change and like driving the market. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, Rod, but I feel like when I sit down with chefs, they're not necessarily like trying to create, they're, they're not like, oh, we're going to like use this ne next new thing to be like the hottest. They're just curious, you mm -hmm. know, they just like in a similar way to, I think you're, what your dad is saying here. They're like, oh, what's fun and interesting. Like, how can we experiment? And, and we what have can learned we do? that they want things that look different and taste different. Yeah. And, and we're having fun working with them where we're connected. It goes from the breeder to the chef. And that's where we're at. Uh, Chef uh, Jonathan Benno was in Idaho last week in our trial grounds. Wow. And went around and s picked out some things that, that he wanted to, to bring back to test. And part of what we're doing is because of different flavors, uh, the potential. I know that adding sugar water... The, the peas, first of all, the leaves become sweeter first. Okay. And it takes a couple of days, and then the pods become sweeter than normal. But you can add other f extracts. For my pea bouquet. So I can t make them sweeter, and I can also make them taste, taste. like banana? No, no, no. <laughs> we're, we're not to banana, but, but we are Maybe at... Maybe horseradish. Uh, Ooh, at, horseradish would be at, good. At maple. Maple, all right. Vanilla. Uh, mint. Uh, lime, Szechuan. What a like exciting way to get Kimchi. introduced to like vegetables too. Yeah. You know, there's like all the possibilities. I feel like. Well, think of of a a, a restaurant that give you a bouquet of peas, and and this say there's three or four plants in this bouquet, and and this one is going to have a hint of of mint, in that. See, it becomes a conversation piece. The, the leaves are going to be stronger than the pods, and they'll sort of discover those kind of things. It goes back and forth. And like a little biology lesson. Yes. Right, in your, right on your you know, dinner table. So, yes, this is more fun 
than breeding green ones that that actually pay our bills. <laughs> but you're like you're still the guy to call if I want my peas flatter and wider. Well, they they want more of them and better <laughs> yields and yeah. those kind of things. And uh, we are more the the ones that are initiating the different flavors. Right. Right. And and we want to call them snap pea candy. Nice. Um, well, so if folks want to find out, you know, more, they can definitely visit the website, eatmorepeas.com. And can they just go on and can I like order packs of seeds to plant by myself or mm-hmm. how does it work? Well, right now, um, since we're a family business, we're, um, we're positioning between uh, our commercial interests and then trying to get to the home garden trade or to um, other growers, like culinary growers. Uh, so we're like right now we're not able to sell anything uh, because what we had existing um, it's sold out or right. we have um, lots of seed that are in with our commercial partners. So uh, I, I can mean, go visit Rick Bishop at the farmer's market. Yeah, for for the product, yes. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, as a company, we're just trying to learn how to how to develop, how to get into these different market seg- segments. And um, but I would you know recommend going to the website because you'll be able to see some of these pictures of these varieties that we've been talking about today. Yeah, I was so amazed. I, I was at the farmers market maybe two three weeks ago, and I picked up two little pints of uh they looked like snow peas but they one was like bright yellow with like a russet red splatter and the other was green with like purple and i'd never seen anything like that and those turned out were your peas Mm -hmm. so cool uh and so beautiful i mean it's like such an exciting i don't know it's like an exciting time well I, I feel like the other thing i want to kind of clarify for folks listening out there is um I guess how I'm, I'm sure you guys get the GMO question, genetic engineering question a lot with the work that you do. And, and I feel like there is a need to kind of endlessly kind of clarify the difference between traditional planting, uh, plant breeding and G technology. And I'm just wondering how you how you answer that for folks, how we can arm people to know that it's OK that your peas are like bright yellow with like red flecks. That's an normal well, thing to happen see those subjects didn't even exist when I was in school that's all new I'm definitely not GMO oriented to the breeding uh, there's plenty of the old fashioned way to s- still breed in peas yeah. I, uh, I, I don't think I'll run out in my lifetime of what we can do uh, there may be a day when we need to produce more food and we may have to add some GMO kind of uh, resistance or tolerance and have food to eat. Right, right. But probably, like you said, not in your not in your lifetime. Maybe in your lifetime, Rod. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the current uh, varieties that we have and that we're working on, it's all traditional, um, you know, plant breeding and like Mendel the Monk. Oh, man, like taking it way yeah, back to... Exactly. Like, I, I want to say like maybe eighth grade? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we are dealing with some of the same characteristics that he he studied. That's a, a key part of breeding still today. The type of seed and the height and and uh, I guess I guess part of me would feel like, man, we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> but it's like it's, it's actually like more exciting, I think, to think that there's like this endless possibility that it's like literally something that like for generations um, well, people you need, can come back to. For example, you need a plant height that is good for picking by hand. Mm-hmm. We have some that that have a lot of tendrils and those, those uh, leaves, you know, that, that they have so many tendrils and they plant four rows on a 40-inch bed and they stand up like a hedge and they are, you know, better to harvest or places where they want to trellis than they need to be taller. And uh, for processing, they want a height. This is where they pick by machine that they they that the machine can pick them pick readily easily, yeah. and, and they want more yield and uh, always more yield. Always evolving. 
Yes. Are, are peas, I mean, is this, t- I'm, I'm assuming that this type of work is happening, in, you know, for squashes or for apples or for that, that this, there's like this whole kind of secret world. I mean, it's not a secret, but it feels a little secret. Uh, well, uh, I was tied to the companies that did corn and they would have super sweet or sugar enhanced. And that's definitely better than the the older varieties, in my opinion. Uh, I see strawberries that are big and firm. And for something as large as they are, I'm really pleased on how sweet they are. You know, right. they're not as sweet as a, a little one. Right. But the, these are more for for sh- shipping and storage. And, and they come to the market. There's a bunch of apples that, that the, the crisp or the ambrosia, uh, pink lady, and those are wonderful. For me, I, I, you know, they're, they're definitely improvements over s- some of the older varieties. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I think most vegetables, if you know more about them, that, that they're improving in many ways. What about for um, kind of the the health impacts of the pea? Um, we're talking about you know sugar content or other nutrients. Is that been part of your work as well, or peas naturally ha- have a good nutrition value, and we're working with, for example, the leafy greens. Now, if you're comparing leafy greens. Peas have much more th- than than just the the plain old iceberg lettuce. They may not have as much nutrition value as kale, but they rank pretty good. Yeah. And they taste better. And I don't want to eat and, kale every day. <laughs> and, and they're they're more tender. And and uh, you know if if you had your choice between and we're working on that. We we, we fully expect that that. Uh, Pea leaves, leafy green peas, are going to become part of of salads. There's potential for juice. You know, pea juice mixed with some apple juice is wonderful. Hey, so you're you're still a pea eater, uh, yeah? You're, you haven't gotten tired of them? Yes, and yesterday we visit Rick Bishop's uh, trial grounds or his production. And he has a variety of ours there that's a large potted pea that has wonderfully sweet peas in it. And I was picking them, eating as fast as I could. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it has been such a treat. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, definitely, if you're out there listening, you want to learn more, you can find out uh, more at eatmorepeas.com. You should get out there. You should eat some more peas if you're here uh, in New York or in Brooklyn, you should visit Rick Bishop. And is there any other farmers we should shoot, send people to here in the area? Uh, L Wife uh, Friday is there. Um, Zaid over at Norwich. Uh, Eckerton has some peas. And uh, Sycamore Farms also has some peas. Nice. So then tell them that Dr. Lambert and Ron sent you guys. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. This was a really lovely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've made your way through another episode of The Farm Report. This, like all programs, uh, you can find on our website, www.heritageradionetwork.org. We are also on iTunes and Stitcher. If you like what you hear, please uh, drop a review. And, of course, we are a member-supported station and would love to have you as a member. Click that beating heart in the top right-hand corner of the website and make a donation. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. 
Thanks for listening.